Thank you. So, give us some statistics. What's this race all about? Well, there you go. We've got a slide for that, so that's good. So, uh, the Golden Globe race is um, a single-handed circumnavigation, and so it's approximately 30,000 miles, and it will be solo, unassisted, non-stop, obviously, and um, in traditional boats, using uh, without the aid of modern technology. So. Now, take us back because obviously we are going back. Uh, more and more races have become uh, more and more high-tech. They've become more and more expensive. And some would say they're more and more difficult to get into. So what's the, what's the motivation of going back and using more traditional technology? Well, the, the Golden Globe, uh, as it is in its modern incarnation, celebrates what Sir Robin Knox Johnson achieved in 1968. And may, most boaters have heard of Sir Robin. So 68, 69, nobody had ever sailed around the world solo, non-stop. So nobody knew if anybody could do that. And when that race took, uh, took place, it was very much, you know, effect effectively amateur sailors. They weren't pro sailors. They put a boat together themselves and they just did it. And then since then, of course, the world of ocean racing has got, you know, incredibly professional. We just watched Pip where, you know, to run a Vendee Globe now requires very significant budgets. And really, it's got out of the reach of, of certainly your, your, your average sailor. So the Golden Globe was reinvented in 2018 uh, by a guy called Don McIntyre. And Don had this uh, concept of trying to take it back to basics, strip it all back, remove a lot of the cost, and make it open to you know, the ordinary sailor, arguably. You know, or certainly uh, open to, to anyone. So the idea is to reduce the cost, keep it simple, and uh, produce a race which will actually take place in traditional production sailing boats. So you can go to any marina in the country and point to a boat like, like Puffin, and you can own that boat and buy that boat, and potentially you could sail that boat around the world. Now, have you got a picture of Puffin? There, there she is there. Um, give us some history of, of, of how that boat started life. So Puffin's a pretty special boat already. So she's a Tradewind 35. So she was drawn in the late 70s, so she's an older boat, she's a long keel, uh, traditional cruising boat, very heavy uh, boat. And she took part in the 2018 race with a guy called Isvan Copper. So Puffin knows her way around the world already. Uh, I'm, I'm, the weak, I'm the weak link in this particular partnership. So, and I've had Puffin since about 2019 and been refitting her and preparing her for, for this race in 22 this year. So. Um where, where did you first, you know, where did the idea first come for you? Where, what was your spark to get you into this? So it's been uh, building for a long time. I mean, I've been inspired by, you know, many of the great sailors that we, I just mentioned Sir Robin Knox Johnson, those kind of stories. So the idea of sailing around the world has been in there, uh, in the back of the mind for many years. Uh, and the idea of sailing, sailing solo is almost like, uh, it's kind of like the ultimate expression of that. Um, so that's been developing for probably 20 years in reality to get to this point today. And then in 2018, this new race was invented. And, and, and I watched that race take, uh, take place. And I just felt that, yeah, I could, I could do this. So. Now, I followed that race. And, and the thing for me that I took away from it was just the fact that anyone could approach this race with almost any background in any boat and have that support because as you go around the world, some of the remote places, by going around in a fleet with different boats at different speeds, you do, you do have a little bit of help around you if you did get in, in, into trouble. Yes, <laughs> but you are very much on your own at the same time. It, it's, it's accessible. I think it is. Yeah. So that's you, what I was driving yeah, at, the accessibility of it. Absolutely. So if you've got the, uh, the motivation and you've got the time and you've got the, uh, the, the, if you like, the ocean experience to put yourself forward, then building a campaign is uh, at least achievable. Let's have a straw poll in the audience. Who would see themselves doing a race around the world. Let's have a few hands up. There we go. Good on you, young lady. Well done. Um, so there we go. This, the, the, you know, we've got a race. We've got uh, a method. We've got a concept. Um, where do we go next? Well, I think if I just uh, share the route for a second. So 
the beauty for me about the Golden Globe race is, it, is A, that it's a race, it's got a format to it. So rather than just disappearing and sailing around the world for nine months alone without stopping, the race, the Golden Globe gives, gives the whole thing a format and, and to your point, a structure. So what will happen is uh, this year, September 2022, which is just around the corner now, it seems, we'll leave from Le Sable de Lone in, uh, in France, which is the home of the Vendée Globe. And again, we had Pip Hair on earlier, so it's exactly the same uh, town. You'll be walking down that same pontoon. Which is quite amazing, and sailing out of the same famous canal that we've seen arguably the greatest ocean sailors in the world sailed out of. And, and we will do that as, as 30 competitors taking part in the Golden Globe race. The slight difference with the Golden Globe race is as we leave port, we will then truly be unassisted for the whole time. So this race harps back to 1968 and 69. So there's a whole bunch of things that I'm, I'm not allowed on board. So for example, we won't have auto helms. We won't have water makers. I can't talk to a short crew. Um, the thing that shocks most people is we won't have GPS. So I will navigate around the world using Astro Navigation as we did back in the day, right? Um, so that does make it a slightly different kind of event. And I, I, would, I would come away from the word slightly and say extremely different. I mean, that is incredible. I didn't, I didn't realize all of those restrictions. Yeah, so it's, uh, they call it a retro race. And the retro is partly to sort of, it's partly because of the spirit of the race, but it's also to strip away some of the complexity. So it, it is right now, it's the longest endurance event in sport. So the very nature of the boats that we're sailing, and I love puffing, but she's never going to go much faster than six knots. So that means I'm, when I leave, I won't touch land again for anywhere between eight and nine months. And during that time, I can't talk to family, I can't send an email or a text message, only to race control. And the beauty about the GGR is they put a race control above us, right, and we have contact with them. But other than that, we're completely on our own. So my water maker is a Mark One bucket. So when the tanks run dry, I'm waiting for it to rain. So although we are in a fleet, at the same time, we are, we, you know, we are very remote, yeah. And, and looking uh, at this course, obviously you crossed the equator uh, twice. Um, you've got Cape Horn, uh, the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, you've obviously got uh, three oceans to cross. Um, where, talk us through the pinch points here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a classic east about course, uh, very similar to the course that, uh, that Pip would have, would have taken on the Vendée Globe, although we won't go quite as far south as those guys. Um, and, and there are multiple pinch points <laughs> on this particular route, as you can imagine. Um, for me, uh, as a sailor, the Southern Ocean is obviously the, the great, the, the reason I'm going Mark, is to see that. Uh, the Southern Ocean is why I'm there. The, the, the South Indian Ocean and the South Pacific Ocean are our, our great big hurdles ahead of us. And then, of course, we've got some major capes. Uh, Cape of Good Hope of South Africa, Tasmania, South Island of New Zealand, not, you know, not to be sniffed at. And, of course, famously Cape Horn before we turn left and, and, and head home. And Cape Horn is obviously the place where you, you, uh, you can take that left-hand turn and every day it starts to get a little bit warmer. And uh, you get away from the Southern Ocean, so yeah, that's that's a that's a that's a corner that you're. I'm sure you'll be looking forward to. Absolutely, I mean it's kind of the dream ticket, and trying to trying to round the Cape on the right day in the right weather. You know, you get what you're given. So we'll see at the time, but it's uh, it's that when you hit Cape Horn and you get around that corner, then obviously that's an enormous achievement in life uh, anyway. Uh, and you've still got the South and the North Atlantic to get across to get home. Do you have any, because um, obviously because of the shape of the, the globe, uh, the further south you go, the shorter route you sail, uh, sometimes the, the more wind you have, uh, you get into the big, uh, the busters coming through. Um, do you have any restrictions against ice when you get low? Yeah, we do. It's a good question. So uh, uh, essentially for a great part of the race, we are restricted to 45 degrees south. And the reason for that, guys, is that ice becomes a, an issue. Now, remember, we're solo sailing. We have no radar, no GPS, nothing to, nothing's going to help us out, but particularly nothing like light like, like radar. So uh, staying out of any risk of ice is quite important. So they stick a limit line. 
Now, we have to navigate along that limit line using Astro navigation, so how close I'll be to <laughs> is anybody's guess. Um, but yes, until we get uh, across the uh, South Pacific before we can drop down to, what is it, 56 south to get around the Horn. Well, I, I have been lucky enough to, to get down to the Southern Ocean and see those incredible albatross. Sometimes I sat there on the back of the boat looking and watching for the, for the wings to beat and you could go all day and they would never flap a wing. They would just sit on the waves behind you. Um, so from a wildlife point of view, what are you looking forward to seeing and, and experiencing? Well, you said it with the albatross. I mean, that's something else. We, we read about these and right? we see it on, on, a, on a TV, but are, they are totally in tune. So I'll be fighting for my life down there while these, these birds will just follow you and never, never even beat a wing. Uh, quite incredible. So, but I am hoping to see quite a lot of, of wildlife along the way. Obviously, whales uh, at different points are of interest. We'll keep away from the uh, the orcas off Gibraltar if we can. So that that would be good. Um, but yeah, for me, that's a massive part of this. Just just being on the ocean for that period of time. It's 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 a it's it's a privilege, right? To to be able to put yourself in that position uh, and unplug for such a long period of time. So, Ian, how, many, uh, how, how big was the fleet in the last race, and, and how big is the fleet going forward? So, in the 2018 edition, there were uh, 18, 18 boats took part, and five completed. Wow. That just goes show, to show the attrition that, uh, that is needed, five finishing out of 18. Yeah, it, it was quite an event, really. Um, so, five, five boats finished. Five vessels were dismasted in that race, and the four rescues took place. Everybody came home safely, which is, which is amazing. And this time in September, we're hoping to have 30, 30 competitors at the start line. And, you know, I think you, you heard Pip talk about preparation. It's even in a retro race, the preparation and the time and the commitment is huge. So if we get 30 at the start line, 50 people would have been trying to get there, you know. Now, talking about preparation um, on this wonderful boat, um, looks like you've got plenty of storage. I know that uh, Sir Robin on Suheili took a lot of canned meat and canned fruit. And I remember having a look at a photograph of the amount of beer and whiskey that he took. Uh, talk us through your vittles. My drinks cabinet. So, my <laughs> so I've got quite a, bit, quite a drinks cabinet. So unlike the Vondo boats, this is a traditional uh, production. So no freeze-dried food. Well, about, probably about 30% threes ride, so a mix. Uh, I will take a lot of canned food, a lot of wet pouches that you'd have at home uh, on the shelf. Remember, I'm at sea for nine months, and you can't live on freeze dried for nine months. I mean, 90 days is pretty tough. 260, 270 days is too much freeze dried. So uh, I will have plenty of corned beef on board, and uh, I am taking a few drinks with me as well, because it's a long time we've had a drink. So. Now, what are the other... Uh, preparation are you doing? I know that um, I, I can't help keep going back to Sir Robin. Uh, he, he actually had a pen, appendicitis that he didn't actually know. He, he, he felt it, but he, it wasn't until he got back that he got told that he had a bust appendix. Um, medically, do you train? Do you train to sort of stitch yourself up and pull a tooth out? And how, how's that going? Yeah, well, we are required to do the uh, the commercial medical courses, so the onboard medics and so on. However, if you ever do one of those courses, it always relies on you performing on someone else. So um, there isn't a course for stitching yourself up, unfortunately. That's what, that's what the whiskey's for, I guess. I guess so. Uh, and I'm not going to take on any surgery before I leave. I'll take my chances, I think, on that. <laughs> I, I'm just really getting my head around your race and what's ahead of you. Um, what do you see... As, as one of the hardest things, you know, what, I guess, what are you worried about right now? I, I hate to be so negative, but what no, are you worried no, about? No, there's plenty of fears. I mean, the, the, you know, one of the biggest, anyone here, the, whatever we take on, when we take a new challenge on, we all go through periods of self-doubt. So you've got to build that in. So again, referring back to what Pip was saying, the preparation is tremendously difficult, getting to the start line, and I am still that's still my day-to-day -day worry. You can, you're constantly concerned about what's going on with the boat. But actually, once I get sailing, I suppose there's several, there's several elements to, to it. Uh, people ask you a lot about loneliness and so on. Um, I'm actually not too concerned about that. I think I'll be fine on that point. I know I can do that for a month at a time. Do I know I can do it for nine months? I, I don't know, to be quite frank. So that, that's going to be a challenge. Um, 
the when you're in the south, you are very much alone. You know, you're days away from anyone else that can assist you. I remember the 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 statistic that when you're in the Southern Ocean, you're closer to the NASA space station. That's the nearest human being to you <laughs> up in space. Which is a bit of a worry if you need someone to give you a hand, right? So, uh, but uh, does that worry me? I, I guess it does, yeah. So some of the anxiety, of course, is, is the serious. I mean, you, you can't underestimate what's going on once you get that far south in this size of boat. So if I'm being very technical for a moment, my boat doesn't move fast enough for me to get away from these systems. So I will take what's given. They will overhaul you. Over, overhaul me every time. So timing for me is really critical. So when I hit the horn, for example, that timing is really critical. So I don't have the same options that a fast race boat would have. Equally, I can't get out of the way very quickly at all. I mean, at, at 120 miles a day, going north or south is the best I could do. You know. Now, I, I hate to keep driving down these uh, more gruesome the points, negatives. but that's what they want to hear. Um, you, you hear about uh, offshore yachtsmen um, battening down the hatches, like taking all the sails off, closing the hatches and letting, and I know that Sir Robin did a bit of that, uh, talk us through what's that's, what that's like. So if you know a system's coming through, you can't sail out the way of it, it's coming, what do you do? So my, my primary method is to keep moving. So at the moment, it's generally considered to be the safest to keep, to keep the boat moving, keep it under control. And then you start to step back from there. So yes, we might go down to bare poles, you're absolutely right, but we're still moving at a fair old pace un under bare poles. Um, I think tonight in the Irish Sea, we're going to get 60, 65 knots, and it's a huge storm coming through for us. Well, we might see that for days, on, literally days on end. Uh, and do you use drones? Yes, yeah, I was about to say. So, so my next stage is, is a drogue, um, and I don't know if you can see it. Actually, it's not on that picture there, but uh, Puffin's a pretty tough boat already. She's a pretty solid boat, and we've basically armored plated her. Uh, and there's great big chain plates at the back of the boat now where I can attach a drogue. So I will batten down the hatches to a point, at a point, and, and deploy a drogue to slow me down and keep that. Basically, keep your bum into the into Keep the you directional. Correct. No, nothing broadside. Nothing broadside, hopefully. That's, and, and if you stay awake at night, that's what you stay awake at night thinking about. Um, in the race, for example, we're all used to auto helms and very sophisticated auto helms on the new race boats. Well, it's a retro race, so I have no auto helm. So I rely on a wind vane steering system, which is on the back of the boat there. So the boat, boat will steer itself, yeah, to, to a wind angle. But obviously, it's a very fragile item. Uh, and if I lose that, that keeps me awake at night. Yeah. So talking about keeping awake, um, how much is sound important for you? Your, your ears as you sleep or try to sleep? That's a, that's a great question, actually. So yeah, sound and sensation, when you're, when you're, uh, once you've been away for, well, even just a few days, you start to get into tune with the boat. So when I go below and I literally batten that hatches down, I'm relying on that. So yeah, sound, sound and sensation is critical. That's, that's how you, the boat tells you when something's wrong and the weather tells you when it's you know, doing something that you need to take action on. Yeah. Let's go to the next slide. Bit of navigation going on here. No modern tech. Hands right. up, who's used a sextant in the audience? Here we go, yeah, a few, well done. The dark arts, the dark arts. So uh, as part of the preparation, I'd never used a sextant before until I decided I was going to uh, take part in this race. So I've been coming up to speed with my, my Astro Nav and I'm just about there now. Uh, so I'm accurate within 10, 10 miles, <laughs> some days within two miles. I guess that's all you need to be, <laughs> as long as it's not cumulative. So just talk us through, so from opening the box, how do you use a sextant? Ah, okay, well... Uh, uh, well how, long it, how long does it take? Oh, it doesn't take so long. So I, uh, my navigation day, so rather than looking at my GPS, taking, just looking where I am, or maybe if you go longhand, you take a plot and you put a plot on your chart or in your logbook, my day will start uh, at well, at, at dawn or just before dawn, well, I'll try and take a star sight. That's the sight. first time you can get a reading. First time, yeah. yeah. As soon as I've got a horizon, I'll try and take a star sight if I can. If I take a star sight, then sometimes you can get a fix there and then because you can take three or four stars. We're getting technical now. But my day progresses. 10 o'clock in the morning, I'll do a sun sight. Midday, I'll do a second sun sight. In the afternoon, 2 or 3 o'clock, I'll do a third sun sight. 
And if I can see the sky and the horizon and the sun, I'll do that every day. And that combination allows me to produce a fix. And what happens if you spend a week under cloud? Dead reckoning. Dead reckoning and hopefully just reckoning. <laughs> just keep on dead reckoning from your last known point. Correct, yeah. yeah. So that's the fundamental. So we all... We don't have a log on board, so I tow a log. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a towed log before. So. Like a little spiral propeller, yeah. Correct, yeah. So you tow a little propeller in the, behind you in the water, and the, the tuna like that, big fish, sharks. So people always say the sharks eat it, but it's... Yeah. You lose a few logs, don't you? You lose a few logs, yeah. So we'll, we'll take a log. Uh, the, the, the red thing in the middle slide there that you can see, that's my, that's my wind vane steering system, so that's my auto helm. And you are allowed soda? Solar? We are, absolutely, yeah. So we, we have to maintain a, a power on board, be, and this is part of being an organized race. So, you know, I am, I, you know, I'm off grid for nine months. It's the ultimate off grid event. So, now, Ian, you said you were going single handed, but what's this fella here in the shot here? <laughs> That's Percy. So, Percy joined me during the qualification passage in, in the summer. Uh, and as I'm not allowed any communication, I thought maybe a carrier pigeon might be, might be a good idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, what was your qualification? What did you have to do? How many miles? So, the race requires you to do 4,000 solo miles, and uh, at least 2,000 of those need to be non stop on the final platform, the final sailing boat that you're taking with you using your sextant and so on. Uh, and I did that back in July, and I used the Azores. So I headed out of North Wales, you know, down the Irish Sea, across Biscay, and the classic route to the Azores, round and back home again. Uh, and that was, that was actually the first time I'd sailed any significant period uh, solo offshore. So prior to that, it was all short trips. So that was about, uh, about 3,000 miles, yeah, about a month. Let's go to the next slide. So these are some of your team, I guess. Team, yeah. I was just uh, trying to make the point, you know, this is a solo race, but there's no way I could achieve this without having a team with me. And uh, unlike the pro skippers, <laughs> they, uh, all my team of volunteers, they're all supporters, have stepped up. And it's a wonderful thing, you know, when you, as a very ordinary person, when you step over the line and say you're going to do something that's extraordinary, the universe kind of steps up too and you know all these people are, have come around me and it just a few faces on here but there's a much greater team than that that have helped me make this happen and uh yeah it's a solo race but you, you definitely can't do it by yourself <laughs> so ian what what's your next uh, obviously coming to boat life was a was a big part of your your lead up to this um but where what's your next what's the next diary date so big diary dates for me right now puffin's finishing her Third refit, I think. We're always in refit. We never stop refit. But we're, this is the final refit before the start in September. And hopefully she'll be on the water at the beginning of April uh, for sea trials and testing. And then in May, I'm going to do some, some longer miles again. I might be heading off towards Iceland uh, for a trip. And the, big, the race starts itself starts in September. And before the race, we have a prologue event in the UK. So there'll be an event the beginning of August from a port in the UK. So w w watch the website, find out where that is. Please. So we yeah. can come along and, and, and cheer you along. Absolutely, yeah. I can, I can do with all the support I can get. So you'll start to see things kick off from May, and then August uh, will be the build-up. And then 4th of September is uh, the race start. And, and, and actually, it's probably worth me mentioning, it's, this is a retro race. So when I'm away, I've got no GPS, I've got no communication, I'm alone. However, there is a tracker on each boat. So you guys will know where I am, even if I don't know where I am, strangely <laughs> enough. So, so you'll be able to follow the race day by day with, uh, with a live tracker and so on. And, you know, I've actually put, obviously put my own website together and so on, uh, Mark. So. Now, do we have any questions for Ian from, uh, I'm sure we've got some questions from the floor. Sir? Is there a limit on the size of the boat? So the question was, is there a limit on the size of the boat? There is. Uh, 32 feet to 36 feet. Maximum size is 36. Yeah. How long was Suheili? So she was 32 foot catch. 32, yeah. yeah, 32 foot catch. Very similar weight to Puffin. Uh, and some of the boats are, you know, a little bit longer, but uh, 36. And, and th 
it, if you designed a boat to go around the Southern Ocean, it wouldn't be 36 foot long. <laughs> it, would, it would be twice that. Well, it'd be 60 foot, funny enough. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Any other questions? So the biggest challenge in the setup? Um, uh, so many challenges. Time, for sure. Uh, preparation of the boat is, is, is a massive piece because it's uh, this, if I may, Mark. Uh, Puffin is, is not just a sailing boat. Puffin is uh, a lifeboat. It's, a, it's my space capsule, right? There is nothing. So I have to make a platform which I can be so totally self-contained within for nine months. So if you imagine living in a 35 foot space for nine months anyway, without, if you like, going outside, outside. But she's, she's got to keep me alive. And that keeps me awake at night. Try, trying to get that right, trying to get that right, yeah. Well, I can, I can feel your emotion, Ian, coming over. You, you must be so excited to, to, to get going. Um, uh, we, we all wish you well. Uh, I, for one, will be following you. I'm going to get onto that tracker and watch you all go round. Um, please, Boat Life Live, please put your hands together. Ian Herbert Jones, thank you very, very thank much. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. And I'm sure if you want to ask Ian or, or, or connect with him after the, uh, after the chat, do so. Listen, best of luck. Seriously, best of luck. Thank you.